Hello my beautiful watchers. In the uh, good lord six plus years that I've been talking about books and stuff on YouTube, I've avoided doing any videos about my favourite series, primarily because I never really got over the sense of loss and deep sadness at the tragically too early passing of the author due to Alzheimer's disease. It emotionally affected me on a level usually only reserved for close friends and family members. However, being back in my childhood home seems to have stirred something in me because I've suddenly gone from naught to a hundred in my desire to gush about his work for a bit, so uh... Yeah, I hope that's what you're in the mood for today. Before we begin, I would just like to give you a second to admire my dad's home office. Uh, it's got floor-to-ceilings bookshelves and one, two, three, four computer monitors. He is literally a mad scientist. I make a lot more sense as a person now, eh? Anyway, Sir Terry Pratchett was a British journalist turned fantasy writer who lived in Somerset, England. He wrote a total of 70 books in his lifetime, which covered a range of fictional subjects, but of course he is best well known for the focus of today's video, the Discworld novels. For his services to literature, he was knighted by the Queen of England in 2009, after which he famously decided that any self-respecting knight needed to own his own sword, so he hand-forged one himself, partly out of meteorite metal that he personally gathered. I had the great honour of seeing it in person in a memorial pop-up museum a few years ago. It was just before I moved out of the country and was probably one of the more deeply emotional moments of my life to date. I admit sword trivia isn't super relevant to his writing, but it gives you an idea of what a fucking badass this guy was. Most of you may know by now that one of my cats is named after him, so that should give you an indication of my level of fanboy when it comes to this author. So Terry has turned up interrupting me in enough bloopers that it might actually be kind of weird for you to hear me using his name to refer to the man himself for once. So, where to start? Well, the briefest description of the setting is, a flat world, a disc if you will, rests on the back of four unbelievably massive elephants, which themselves stand on the shell of a giant turtle named Great Atuin, who eternally flies through space. So Terry explains that it exists in a part of the universe that is just magical enough that you can get away with this sort of thing. The stories are fairly well spread out over the disc, though the most popular setting is the massive sprawling city of Ankh Morpork, which I will swing back to in just a moment. One of the first reasons I love love this series is the humour. My beautiful watchers, I promise you Sir Terry is the wittiest author you will ever come across. These books can be laugh out loud funny from start to finish. I will say it is very British humour, i.e. fueled by a lot of sarcasm and dry wit, with a generous helping of absurdity as well. If that's not your jam and you've found you've struggled with British comedies before, then you might not get as much out of them as I do. Because his books are so very, very funny, engaging and creative, some people fail to realise that Sir Terry was also a pretty intense person person with very strong political views, and he was not afraid to work that into his novels. Themes of social, racial and economic inequality feature almost constantly, along with critiques of the blind acceptance of the status quo. There's fantasy races of all shapes and sizes on the Discworld, though the three most populous besides humans are dwarfs and trolls. And trolls are silicon-based lifeforms, appearing at a glance to be living rocks. Their brain function speeds up and slows down depending on the temperature, so they tend to appear quite stupid on an average day but catch one on a winter's night and they will be able to explain quantum theory to you. Dwarves start out pretty much standard Tolkien-esque in early novels, but Sir Terry really gets into their fascinating culture as the world expands. A very interesting example is their gender. The male and female sexes of the species are virtually indistinguishable, universally having deep voices and long beards, and over the years a social pressure has developed for all dwarves to present male and keep their biological sex a secret. Apparently, a major part of Dwarven courtship is attempting to subtly figure out your partner's sex without being rude. This whole thing isn't just a quirk, by the way. Sir Terry was using stuff like this to make people question gender norms decades before the common awareness of it was raised. The before-mentioned Ankh Morpork is heavily based on the city of London, though with a bizarre mix of features that seem to range from the medieval period to the late Victorian era. Sir Terry also worked in a lot of pop culture references, so some things seem positively modern at times. The city used to have kings but a few centuries before, a revolution resulted in the city being run by a patrician from then on. It still seems to be a lifetime position, but at least isn't hereditary. The current patrician is called Lord Vetinari. He's a really fun character, he's the pure embodiment of the glorious bastard trope, being one step ahead of almost everyone at all times. He's also really intimidating, he has this catchphrase for when he's dismissing you, he just says, uh, don't let me detain you, in a way that makes it very clear that what he's actually saying is, don't give me a reason to. Vetinari has a super out of the box way of thinking about everything. He solved the issue of crime in the city basically by 
legalizing it. You're allowed to steal things as long as you're a licensed thief and part of the Guild of Thieves. You're only allowed to steal a certain amount each quarter and people can make a voluntary donation to the Guild and avoid it altogether. As the Guild is now in charge of stopping unlicensed thievery and are quite zealous in doing so to protect their profit margin, the criminal element of the city effectively controls itself. Other notable guilds include the Assassins, the Beggars and the Alchemists whose building regularly explodes as they keep messing with new chemicals. My personal favourite character makes an appearance in almost every book, the personification of death. He's also a really fun character because of how differently he thinks to most people, which makes sense considering he's an anthropomorphic concept that's been around since the dawn of time and will remain until the end of the universe. Most of the time he's a side character, popping up after someone dies to lead their soul to the afterlife. He's usually played pretty straight, but Sir Terry manages to make him really, really funny despite, or possibly because of this. He stars in some of his own books eventually, though he he often shares the spotlight with his adopted human granddaughter, Susan Stowe Hellett. His deal is, he worked with humans for so long, he couldn't help but develop an interest in them and attempts to learn more about what it is to be human. Because of this investment, he will occasionally indirectly intervene to save the world from cosmic threats, usually by outsourcing to Susan, who isn't bound by as many divine non-interference laws as he is. The very early Discord novels leaned very heavily towards being one-for-one -one parodies and satires, putting comedic or more cynical twists on other well-known works of fiction and real-world events. Later novels still involved places and people who were obvious allegories, but the cast of characters that these stories focused on developed super distinct and unique personalities of their own. Also changing over time was the nature of the sequels. The first half dozen or so had more of an emphasis on one-shot characters and events that just happened to all share a world, but Sir Terry quickly started getting into longer running series, usually with ensemble casts. Sir Terry also used the Discworld books to deconstruct and analyze fairy tale tropes and explore how the fiction we grew up with affects our subconscious expectations for real life. The way he makes you think about this is really clever. Unlike in our world on the disc, the power of stories, narrative and expectation actually does hold sway over big world changing events. The story beats, tropes and cliches of fairy tales and legends spring up on a fairly regular basis. If a monster arises to steal a fair maiden, a hero inevitably pops up to save them and when a man becomes a grand vizier to a king, he feels compelled to plot against him. It's that sort of thing. The reason being, in this dimension in which physics and reality are more of a suggestion than a law, the power of people's belief is a tangible thing so intense it changes the world to suit it, so people's deep-seated expectations of an outcome can drive fate and destiny to make it happen. What makes this theme even more interesting is that most of the population are at least on some level aware of it. Some find it comforting as it means most problems will sort themselves out eventually, some seek ways to use it to their own advantage to varying levels of success, and some absolutely hate it, feeling it reduces their free will and even manage to defy it on occasion. This power of belief also applies to the gods of the Discworld. Gods are created by religions and their natures change depending on what people believe about them. They can gain power or lose it altogether depending on how many people believe in them and how genuinely they believe it. FYI, this theological concept is also explored very creatively by Sir Terry Pratchett's friend Neil Gaiman, who's featured on this channel a few times now. They're making season two of Good Omens, I, I just found out today. Okay. As tempting as it is to ignore a negative in a series you love, I do feel behooved to mention that there is an uncomfortable amount of fat shaming in these novels. It's not always there, but once you start to notice it, it can be a little unpleasant. I don't think it was intended to be hateful, it just comes off a little thoughtless. A bit of a blind spot in an otherwise very conscientious author. Not necessarily a negative, but I think important to note that I think the effect that Sir Terry's Alzheimer's had on later books is very noticeable, both in the quality of the writing as doing it all himself became impossible, and the tonal shift that I think understandably came about from him knowing that he was dying, combined with the anger he talked about feeling regarding the lack of information available to him about his disease. The stories take on a darker tone, not, I'm happy to say, a less optimistic one, just more of an emphasis on the dark concepts and even more focus on the heavy 
heavy subjects than before. Whether this change increases or decreases your enjoyment of them, of course, depends entirely on you and what resonates with you. Right, I'm going to give you a rundown of two of the most popular of the aforementioned series, the City Watch Collection and the Witches novels. The Watch books are best described as police procedurals set in a pseudo-medieval fantasy setting, so in addition to petty crime, misdemeanors and murders, they also have to deal with things like dragons, magical self-aware weapons that corrupt people's minds, and clay golem revolutions. Do keep in mind that these books were written in Britain a good 30 years ago, when being a copper was perceived as more of an honest, humble, but honourable profession. So Terry does include a huge problem with corruption in the watch in the first two books, but after a while all the bad apples get sorted out, and you're left with just the fundamentally good policeman. This probably wouldn't bother a British reader, but might feel a little off to Americans and people in other countries that are dealing with escalating police violence right now. I do sometimes wonder how and if Sir Terry would have addressed that sort of thing in his books if he had not been taken from us so soon. The main focus tends to lean towards Commander Vimes, a complex man and a grizzled veteran with an Ironheart sense of justice. Kind of like Dirty Harry if he wasn't trigger happy. He starts the series kind of an extreme burnout, but gets a second win put in him, making a lot of the subsequent stories about his second chance at making a difference to the world. He's on the verge of retirement in basically every book, but can never quite let go enough to actually do it. The guy who turned his life around was Captain Carrot. His very concept is hilarious because he is very, very clearly the long lost son of the line of kings and the true heir to the throne of Ankh Morpork. He's got all of the fantasy cliches, including the distinctive birthmark and a family sword passed down through the ages. At the start of his story, all the stars appear to be aligning for his epic rise to fame and fortune, but in one of the previously mentioned defiance of fantasy story expectations, it turns out he doesn't really approve of monarchy as a political structure, and has zero interest in being a king. He just wants to be a policeman. He sort of comes off as a classic himbo at first, but he's way more intelligent than he lets on. It just took him a little while to get used to life in the big city because he was raised by an isolated group of dwarfs. He is so genuinely enthusiastic, determined and positive, he tends to inspire people around him to do better even if it's somewhat against their will. He's also insanely likeable to pretty much everyone, in a way that Vimes thinks should be really annoying, but you can't help but forgive him for it because you end up liking him so much yourself. Then there's Sergeant Angra, the werewolf who doubles up as the Force's canine division, Sergeant Detritus the Troll, who uses a siege ballista as a handheld crossbow, and Sergeant Colin and Corporal Nobby Nobs, who are endearing incompetent leftovers from before the watch made its comeback. Fuck, this is such a good series. Now, the Witches novel started out as a parody of Macbeth, but incorporating the what-if concept that the witches were the heroes and wanted to arrange a better ending for everyone involved. After that, Sateri kept it going and detailed the adventures of these three titular witches, keeping their backwater kingdoms safe and occasionally travelling around the world. These novels are a little more balanced in their main characters, being fairly evenly split between the three of them if they're not working as a unit. Their names are Granny Weatherwax and Nanny Og and Magrat Garlic. Granny is undeniably a good person, but she often comes off as grumpy and impatient, mostly because she gets a little emotionally exhausted from having to keep up with people's constant misconceptions about witchcraft, assigning dark occult magics to what is often just common sense. If someone comes to her seeking help for back pain, she ends up having to give them a noxious looking potion to drink during the full moon to keep them happy, before doing sneaky chiropractics on them to actually fix the issue. That is not to say that she can't do magic, she's just very aware that solving issues using it always comes at a cosmic price, so 9 times out of 10 it's better just to fix things yourself. This attitude can sometimes lead to other magical beings underestimating her, but a fair example of how ridiculously powerful she actually is, is one time a family of vampires bit her, and instead of her starting to crave blood, they ended up going mad craving tea and biscuits. Nanny Og is relatively straightforward in comparison, and just a delight. She's the mother and grandmother of a huge family, and is incredibly open, caring, and kind to almost everyone. One thing I like in particular about her is, despite her age, she is consistently very sex positive. Magrat is the junior witch of the group, and, like the people who annoy Granny Weatherwax, is a little too into the somewhat superfluous occult traditions associated with witchcraft, something the older witches try to be understanding of. It sometimes frustrates Magrat that Nanny Og performs her scrying in the leftover soapy water in her laundry tub instead of in a crystal ball, without so much as a purple candle for ambience. 
The three of them together Loki embody the three elements of the neo-pagan triple goddess, the maiden, the mother, and the crone, though no one would dare call Granny Weatherwax a crone to her face. Other such frightfully heathen beliefs play a large part in their stories on the regular. Other fun characters who pop into these and other novels include Rincewind, a wizard utterly incapable of performing even the simplest magic. He's a lovable abstract coward who somehow falls into situations that require him to save the world over and over again. Cohen the Barbarian, the answer you didn't realize you needed to the question of what happens when the most legendary hero to ever live gets really, really, really old but retains all of his nearly undefeatable combative abilities. The Librarian, the bookkeeper of Ankh Morport's Wizard University, who was turned into an orangutan in a magical accident and henceforth resisted all attempts to turn him back because he liked being crazy strong and not having to wear trousers. Cheery Littlebottom, the first openly female dwarf in the world. Reg Shu, a zombie undead rights activist turned police officer. Gaspode the Wonder Dog, a mangy flea ridden talking dog with surprisingly useful street smarts. Dorfel, a giant magically powered clay man with a newly discovered concept of personal freedom. Death's white horse Binky, he's mostly just a normal horse but he's really cool. Death at one point tried a skeletal horse and a flaming steed but found them wildly impractical as modes of transport. The death of rats, a small but very driven part of death that death allows autonomy. Quoth the Raven, the death of rats translator and steed. And the wee free men, Celtic coded pixies that escape the fey lands and like the discord so much they believe it's their afterlife. A violent but cheerful group. So yeah, I hope that if you're a fan of this series you enjoyed this mugging down memory lane. Please do let me know in the comments which book or character is your favourite. I will never get tired of gushing with people about this series. If you have not yet had the pleasure of Sateri's work, I of course would never try to pressure anyone into reading something, but if you don't you will be deeply disappointing me and making me cry. Why would you do that, my beautiful watchers, when all I do is try to bring you joy? Before you go, please don't forget to do all those help a YouTuber survive on this hell site things like liking, sharing, commenting, and subscribing. Please take care of yourselves out there, and I hope to see you next time. Weird sisters, feet of clay, soul music masquerade, unseen academic calls on the less continent. Lords and ladies, equal rights, these are interesting times. More the jingo snuff, the fifth elephant. Like fantastic small gods, witches that have gone abroad. Maurice is amazing for the way he teaches rats. Hog father pyramids, making money went to Smith. Check out how much of the sky I can't fit. love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Shelby Holt, Sattel Spurtloff, and Kat Harker. Shout out to Il Nej for performing this awesome tune, check out his channel for more parody and original songs, and a huge thank you to this video's co-producer, Kate Robinson. She does some really amazing work on her channel that I think you would really enjoy, so be sure to check that out too. Social, racial, and economic in in inequality. Inequality. In a quality. Which makes sense considering he's an anthrop anthropomorphic. Ah, oh, I shouldn't have written that word, I don't know how to say it. Anthropom anthrop anthropomorph. One of the line of kings that was lost, long lost son that was lost. Good writing.